Thank you for coming so early this morning. Uh, it is my pleasure and an honor to uh, welcome you here to this panel on the personal data in texts. Uh, this panel was inspired by the Decrypt project that uh, I'm leading at the University of Franche Comté. My name is Jana Atanasova and I'm assistant professor in natural language processing. Um, and so for this panel, we will have four distinguished and internationally renowned speakers. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, present the first speaker, uh, who is Professor Hitoshi Isahara. Professor uh, Isahara is a specialist in computational linguistics uh, and professor in the, at the Toyohashi University of Technology in Japan. So if we have the connection with Professor Isakara, uh, we can invite him to speak. Okay, so uh, the, the, the intervention of Professor Isakara was uh, scheduled to be online and we can come back to him uh, later. Okay, so uh, I will present then Professor Sylvian Carde, uh, who is a specialist in linguistics and natural language processing, a senior member of the uh, Institut Univers Universitaire de France, uh, and professor at the University of Franche Comté uh, in France. Uh, she will talk to us about the semantic framework for uh, the detection and annotation of personal data in texts. So, Sylviane, you have the floor if you hear us. Uh, thank you, Jana. Uh, I and some creating limits on the domains. The application are essentially for protecting human data security in national and international industries and private and private and public organizations. Copy technology for the development and globalization are both new challenges for the protection of personal data. The principle of data protection should apply to collecting information concerning an identified or identified vulnerable person. An identified vulnerable person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by its reference to an identifier, such as, for example, the name, an identification number, a bank account number, location data, such as residence address, an online identifier. Of one or more factors sensitive to the physical, physical, emotional, physical, internet, sexual, or social identity of the natural person. But we don't deal here with the, the last one. In this context, in most industries, the one month of the day requires the hospital training or the organization. You need to have privacy eyes, remove, anonymize, or pseudonymize the personal data before kept. The process of traceability we have created is first of all to detect and identify personal data so that it can be hidden or suppressed, that is protected before transmitting, transmitting or and processing the text containing such data. The problem is that
Thank you, Sylviane. Uh, thank you for the very uh, clear presentation. Uh, I just want to say that after the round of four presentations, there will be time from, for questions and answers uh, with the public. So if you have any questions, don't, he don't hesitate to uh, ask uh, just a little bit later. Okay, so now we can uh, uh, go to the second uh, speaker that we have today. Uh, this is on, also a speaker online, uh, Professor Itoshi uh, Isahara, who is a professor in computational linguistics 
at Toyohashi University of Technology. Do we have connection with Professor Isakara? Okay, uh, uh, we are actually seeing you uh, in the camera, and, and now we are seeing your slides. So uh, welcome, Professor Isakara. Uh, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you.
Do you hear me? Oh, okay. Thank you, Professor Isakaro, for this uh, very interesting talk. Okay, so as I said uh, previously, uh, we will have time for questions at the end of the panel. So now I will pass the floor to our third speaker, who is Professor Thierry Brenyar. Uh, Thierry Brenyar is professor at uh, uh, the Haute Ecole de Gestion, ARC, at Neuchâtel, uh, Switzerland. And so, uh, Professor Brenyar, you have the, the floor. Thank you very much. So, hello everybody. I have the pleasure to present the results of a quantitative market survey, uh, which was uh, carried out uh, uh, during the second semester of last year in France and in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. So this uh, um, quantitative market survey was realized uh, within the framework of a uh, project. The project is named Decrypt. It's an interreg uh, project. That means it's financed by uh, public authorities from France and from Switzerland. We got uh, 304 full answers, 240 from France and 54 from uh, Switzerland. Uh, we can affirm it's representative and it's uh, relevant representation of uh, uh, sizes and sectors of activity as well in private as in public um, organizations. We are covering uh, three main topics with this uh, market survey. First, governance. Second, uh, detection in free text of personal data. And third, masking of personal data. We are currently uh, carrying out a qualitative uh, uh, market survey to deepen some specific aspects uh, which were um, noted uh, through this uh, quantitative market survey. So, first question, are you subject to the GDPR? And amazingly, in France, uh, there are some, few, but some organizations which answered no, we are not subject to the GDPR. We don't, we don't sell we don't tell about who uh, was answering this. Less amazingly, in Switzerland, uh, a majority of answers uh, were negative answers. Uh, you have to know that in Switzerland we have a specific uh, law about protection data, which is generally not, not so requesting, uh, demanding as uh, GDPR. And um, we, through the qualitative uh, market survey, we can uh, now confirm that a lot of uh, economic and political actors in Switzerland are not aware of the fact that GDPR can be applied to them. Because as soon as a Swiss company or organization is working with or in Europe, uh, GDPR is uh, the reference. So there is a first conclusion. We need a, a kind of awareness campaign uh, in Switzerland to, to explain uh, the importance of this, uh, of this um, GDPR. Uh, second question, how do you assess the risk related to GDPR non-compliance and data security in your organization? And we can um, see that almost half of the answers in France are concluding that there is a high risk um, that it's not GDPR compliant in their organization. So there is still a lot of work to make organization uh, compliant with or to uh, GDPR. And in Switzerland, uh, it's uh, even uh, worse. There is a problem, technical problem. Don't know what's happening. 
uh, yeah, right. so for Switzerland, uh, uh, almost all organizations are considering that there is no risk, but uh, uh, there is a problem here. Okay, uh, for France, we it's interesting to to ask: Do you consider that your organization is compliant with the GDPR? And only 13 percent of the answers uh, are considering that they are fully compliant. Uh, 42 percent almost fully. That means that a little bit less than half of the answers are telling us, no, we are not uh, compliant. So again, a lot of job for uh, consultants and other people uh, who can help to make organizations compliant to GDPR. And it's interesting to know what are the problems? What are the main uh, GDPR issues for which organizations didn't find any solution? And uh, here it's interesting to notice, it's a little bit uh, little in the slides. Uh, the first uh, um, GDPR issue is alert system on sensitive data. The second data masking, data inventory, external subcontracting, data governance, specific procedures, data access control. And it's interesting about awareness and training of employees. Uh, there are almost 50 answers uh, which are telling us we are not managing very well uh, awareness and training of employees. Penalty system and 19 about function of uh, data protection officer. Another question for us which is very important. How important is data and information management in achieving your strategy and objectives? And it's confirmed as well in France as in Switzerland that data are very, very strategic for organizations. Okay, second chapter, it's about um, personal data in texts, in free text, in documents. Uh, and it's clear that uh, majority of uh, organizations are managing text doc documents with personal data. And for what types of personal data? Main uh, areas are prospects and customers, but employees, personal data about employees are very important, especially, especially in Switzerland. Third uh, chapter is about masking uh, data. Do you need to mask data in your organization? Uh, clearly, majority of answers in France, yes. In Switzerland, no. But again, uh, and the qualitative market survey is confirming as this aspect, uh, it's more about uh, non-full awareness about these requirements in protec data protection. For what types uh, of personal data do you need to mask in your organization? Again, it's mainly prospects and customers. And the third part is employees, and it's a very important part in Switzerland, so personal data regarding employees. And for me, it's one of the most important uh, question and answer because uh, it's confirming that we need uh, some automatic tools for masking data, personal data. The question is how do you mask data in text today? And uh, it's manually, majority manually, with a high risk of mistake. And second, uh, we have no mean, no uh, no tool to make it, and there are some uh, automatic tools today in the market, but it's not the, the main uh, way that uh, organizations are masking data today. Is there any value in creating a tool for governance of personal data? 
detection of personal data in texts and for masking this personal data? It's clearly yes, uh, but there are a lot, especially in Switzerland, no opinion answers because we noticed and we are so currently uh, carrying out this qualitative with interviews, so qualitative market survey, that uh, a lot of organizations are not aware about the, the fact that it's needed or how to mask personal data, especially in, uh, in free te texts. And it's important, to, uh, again, to have a kind of communication, to have a campaign to explain these issues, these challenges, and the possibilities at technical level to solve these problems. Okay, so last um, question. What importance do you give to the different criteria? We gave a list of uh, criteria for the choice and use of uh, these tools, uh, automatic tool for governance, tech detection, and masking personal data. And it's clearly performance. So uh, I wouldn't say that price is not important, <laughs> but the first criteria is performance because they have such um, a huge uh, reputation and finance uh, impacts in case of uh, uh, no uh, masking correctly, no detection correctly of personal data, or no governance correctly personal data, that the first criteria is performance. So there is a very important uh, market and important needs about governance, um, detection in texts, and uh, um, masking uh, personal data. Thank you very much, and uh, I have the pleasure to answer to you, your questions after the next uh, uh, next intervention. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will now uh, welcome our fourth speaker, Dr. Walid El Abed. Uh, Dr. El Abed is a linguist and a computer scientist and also a self-photographer. He has many titles and I will just mention some of them. So he is the general advisor of the Worldwide Association for Human Rights. He is the creator of Dems Nixus and also the CEO of Global Data Excellence and the founder of Global da Data Excellence. So, Dr. Elabet, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Jana. <coughs> and uh, I am very delighted to be with you today to talk about uh, personal data protection. But before actually to protect anything, you need to identify it first, and then you need to govern, and then actually you need to uh, protect. So, and before protecting, you need to know actually what uh, are the rules and the rights actually that the person has so that, so that you protect. Actually, data-related issues are literally linked to the human rights and the natural rights of everybody. And this is actually the thing that we need to be all aware of. So <clears throat> for that purpose, we created in Switzerland, or you have seen the, uh, or the presentation from uh, uh, the previous speakers, and it is actually something like 35 years of uh, science, uh, 35 years of research and uh, uh, applications and uh, in very, uh, risky environments in the army, in the s global safety and security, etc. And we embedded actually this into a system. So this system is now available for uh, the uh, uh, private sector as well and for the public sector. So uh, what is the digital context here? Sorry. So exponential volume of data. And when I say exponential volume of data, do you know that only 10% of the data is uh, structured? Even what we call the unstructured data, it is already structured because actually it is indexed and we can access it within a machine, like in big data. But the majority, so 90% of the data is text. 
It's in your uh, WhatsApp messages. It is in your uh, Facebook. It is in your uh, LinkedIn. It is everywhere, actually, in your publications. It's everywhere. So 90% of your value, actually, because your data is literally linked to your value, you, what is your value is what you can generate, what you can buy, what you can sell. This is your value. So if we know what you like, we know what, you, what to sell to you. And we can actually literally manipulate you to, uh, you know, to buy. Uh, if I know that I, I love the Crete Island, if someone knows that, actually, if there is any event, actually, that so they will combine things. And if they know that many people are loving Crete in Greece, then they will actually make a conference in Greece and combine it with something that you like. And then uh, you have a lot of money that will be generated for tourism more than the money that is for the main purpose, which is the conference. And actually the purpose, the purpose-driven society here is just uh, dismantled. There is no purpose, actually. So a uh, big amount of data. And so how we can govern, govern this data, the, govern this personal data from the text. And this is actually, uh, we embedded this into a, uh, an artificial intelligence, but a new kind of artificial intelligence. So. Uh, an artificial intelligence that must understand ethics, that must understand GDPR, that must understand the European Act, Data Act. So compliance to those regulations, compliance to the values of the customer, it becomes a must. And if it is a must, actually the machine must understand it. It is not about machine learning. It's, about, it's not about connecting words together as we said, actually, at the beginning was the verb, right? But actually, in our world, the new world that we are creating, at the beginning is not the verb, it's the sense. It's the meaning. So the meaning first, and then the words express the meaning. So if we continue with our technology that is just tackling the uh, words, tackling the uh, learning, the machines, and the images, and the recognitions, etc. Uh, we will not go far because the digital era is more about uh, digital value. Digital value, which means that the data becomes your major asset. Actually, it's your only asset. So you know, if you go to, the, uh, to a border of any uh, airport of any country and you present your passport, and in your passport I see your face, you are actually, it's you, but it is written you are a female. Okay, and actually I look male. Actually, who they will believe? You have two choices. The first choice is that they say that this passport is fake. Okay, the second, actually you transformed your sex. Okay, so you were uh, female and you became male. This is very personal, but this actually will create a scandal where at the airport with who is impacted? is you personally. But this is just one example. It can be in any example. So now, as uh, you know, the, the analysis of this text data, the meaning of the thing is becoming crucial. Because the meaning of the thing, this is what identifies the thing. So if we say Geneva, everyone, oh, Geneva, some, some people, they can confuse Geneva with Genova, you know, in uh, Italy. Uh, but if we say Geneva in Switzerland, so everyone will understand that it's Geneva in Switzerland. This is explicit. But actually, if I say that the city in the board of the lake, actually raise your hands, who understands what is that? Two? <laughs> yeah. Two, pe two people, okay? But actually, Everyone knows that it's Geneva, in Geneva. So actually the non-nominated, uh, you know, non-named entities uh, uh, is the problem. Because if you say uh, Dr. Walid El Abed, you can seek for redundancy of, uh, you know, similar names. But if you say Nobel Adorateur, nobody. But if you say the man that is married with this lady, if they know the lady, they will know. But if you say, actually, the uh, uh, CEO of Global Data Excellence, more people will know. 
And if you say that he is the general advisor of uh, the National Association of Human Rights, others will know. So actually the context, the context is extremely important to understand the meaning, the inner sense of things. And this is the new AI that we need actually so that we can govern. We don't need AI that actually makes similarities between words, etc., and detect your face. You know, if you say a woman uh, in English or a, or, or, or a uh, femme in French, uh, if you speak French or English, uh, we will understand. So how do we do with the techniques of machine learning? We bring a hell of photographies uh, of a woman, of women, of all types, etc., and we give it to the machine. And the machine, uh, we need uh, large microprocessing, and we, we need a huge amount of data so that we understand the sense of at 95% of a woman. And this is only one concept. Imagine all the concepts that we have actually around us to do business. Uh, and if you, a woman take a parachute and actually uh, jump from a bridge and we take the picture and we give it to this machine that became really smart, it will not recognize. It will think that it's an ovni, okay? Because the, the machine is blind. It does not understand. So that's why also we need machines that can understand from the sense. That's why at the beginning was the verb, and at the beginning of the digital era is the sim, what Professor Sylvian Cardet talked about. The sim is the meaning, is your meaning. It is one code. It is one code that actually represents a unique meaning of something. And everything else actually is just a, an expression of it, whatever it is named or not named. This is how we uh, do business, and this is how we actually build uh, uh, knowledge. So we go from data, we have uh, you know, technologies that transform data into information, that then transform it into knowledge, then into insight, then into wisdom, or actionable data. But what is actually uh, uh, scaring here is at each level it is different experts that are doing the work and different tools. So actually the meaning is lost. At each step is lost. So actually our wisdom with our approach today is, uh, is uh, uh, increasingly uh, proportional to the quality of the data that we used at the beginning. And it is actually also depending on the interpretation of this data that actually became information. So we are lost in translation. So when we come to the wisdom, so we start with the, our purpose is to have gender equality, to eradicate poverty. So then uh, actually this is our goal, but in order to reach our goal with our standard tools, what we do, we analyze the data that we have. Of course we know that there is no gender equality in the data because in the past we didn't have this purpose. So meaning that whatever conclusions that you will have from your uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the standard one, the conventional one, uh, it will not work. It will not work. At the most, actually, you will, it will explain, at the most, huh, it will explain how did you do your job? How did you perform? Because actually we are uh, uh, governed by performance. Because the companies, the governments, etc. we have a budget, we need to expand to spend and then actually we have to enter into within this budget and we are actually performing against the budget, the performance. And if we don't spend the money, the money has to return back. If the money returns back actually, uh, uh, then you didn't actually deliver the value but it is fine because you perform, you were within budget. And this is how we are actually measured today. And all the governments, enterprises, etc., they are governed that way. So the problem is not to protect, it's to govern, to govern the value. So a new AI is needed. A new AI that respects the ownership. 
the ownership of the data. If you have a Google or a, a Watson is coming, it's today, oh, give me all your health data, and this is reality. It happened in multiple European countries, okay? Give me uh, with Watson or with Palantir, give me your data, and I will give you miracles, and I will find you actually a way to, for vaccines or uh, for whatever, you know, or the need for the masks, et cetera, et cetera. And what we do actually is that if we are heading to a digital era where the data is our asset, it is just that we are giving them our gold, if you, if you have the same image. Because before, the gold was the value. Today, the data is the value. And we need an artificial intelligence that is capable of not only respecting the data at the source, so the data remains at the source and under the ownership of the source, and not giving it into you know, a data lake or big data, et cetera, and connect it together through a semantic layer, through a meaning layer for cooperation. Uh, we need integrated knowledge base as well. What does that mean? GDPR is articulated. It is in text. We have the book actually uh, upstairs. You can take it and you can read it. So it is possible if we actually change just the paradigm from a data-driven AI into meaning-driven AI, into uh, value-driven AI, we are able actually, and we proved it with, the, with science, with the, the technology, with the algorithms, we proved that we can actually integrate GDPR completely into a machine. And the machine will understand your GDPR, will identify actually with the decrypt project, actually we proved it, that we can identify the personal data, the value data, and we are able to protect it and we are able actually to uh, make it compliant, enforce compliance. And this is uh, real and we did actually a, a pilot with some uh, large companies, even in Switzerland. So a new type of uh, AI, uh, again, ethical AI that contains the value, the SDGs. We have sustainable development goals. We have 17 of them. How do you measure them today? How do we measure them? Actually, I will tell you. She said I am an ego, what, ego photographist? Self-photographer, Self yeah. So I have actually almost 20,000 pictures of myself, okay? In different cities, etc. everywhere I go. Boop, 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 boop. So, uh, to <laughs> uh, so the, uh, and in, in, uh, on top of that, I gave them to a machine and just recognize me. You know what? This is a defeat. These glasses, you put them, no artificial intelligence on earth can recognize you. Do you know what are these glasses? The Reban pilot. This is a secret for you. If you want to pass through any artificial intelligence, just put a Reban pilot. Okay, so now we need an artificial intelligence that recognize who are you? Who are you? What is your meaning? What is your purpose? The SDGs must be understood also by this ethical AI. Collaborative, meaning connecting intelligence together, co connecting the smartness. We did a, a, a project with the uh, justice and police of the Netherlands, and you know that you cannot communicate personal data. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, against the law, okay? So with an ethical AI, we proved actually that you can do the purpose without, without actually merging the data together, making people cooperating. Uh, know your customer. Know your customer is know your criminal, you know your refugee, know your uh, homeless, know these uh, things. And today, if you have, uh, uh, if you, have uh, you know, uh, justice, 
or if you go to the justice ministry, uh, each case is independent of the other case. They don't know you as a whole, as a person. They know case by case. This is what happens. So ethical AI is uh, important, and the smartness has to be connected, cooperated. So why, why this ethical AI is uh, required is for your safety, privacy, security, reliability, and data ethics. And today, actually, uh, it is recognized. It is recognized by Gartner, by the Horizon 2020, because it was developed, actually, with the Horizon, Horizon 2020 uh, framework. It was financed by Europe. It does not to transfer uh, customer data. Data remains at the source. Consensus of analytic analysts uh, 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 on this AI, the Interreg, the EU, uh, transparent and visible. So all the algorithms, all the algorithms are actually uh, transparent. You can see them. This is how it shows. This is the semantic model of the compliance for consent. So consent as one obligation of the 106 from the uh, uh, GDPR is articulated like this. This is what is in the spirit of the uh, machine. So the machine understands this semantically. So then this comes actually from what? From the text. This is the text of the GDPR. Literally, there is no uh, intermediate so it is translated literally, thanks to the semantics, to the machine code. So here, if you change a word there, it will change there. So you don't have a computer scientist that comes that actually will do functional specifications so that actually you can uh, uh, create the program and you don't even know what is inside this program, okay? So then, uh, the semantic meta model of person because the consent applies to the person. So I need to understand the rule and I need to understand the person so that I can apply the rule. And of course, uh, the detection or the protection, so once we do that, we are able to know if, if we are actually compliant or not compliant. We know actually if uh, 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 we are transgressing this law or not and for which person, and we know exactly the fines that we incur, and we know the impact, but actually without putting structured governance on top so that we follow the breach before it comes. <coughs> we need to move, and this will be uh, my last uh, really uh, wisdom, from uh, compliance to governance, meaning from a punitive, punitive approach to a preventive approach. So that actually the data, my data of today can tell me if I will breach actually uh, tomorrow. So why I don't govern and put a structure, a stewardship, people to govern, to anticipate that, they, that I avoid actually the breach. And for this, we need to change the mentality because it's an economical model and the professor can talk about it because we need to make money out of GDPR. So we need to move from money-driven to value-driven, where money is just uh, one part of the value, which is the quantitative uh, value, but we need to have the uh, uh, qualitative value, which is our ethics, our values, etc., and they have to be connected together. So we need to prevent the value creation process uh, from uh, breaching, actually, personal data with organization. We need so a cooperation between humans and machines, where the machines are not the tools. They are our, uh, you know, alter ego, because they are the uh, things that will connect things together, that will connect our smartness together, that will understand our meaning better than ourselves. Because I know myself, but I don't know you. But the machine, if the, it, she, it knows you, and it knows me, it will actually connect if there is a purpose common between us, and it will be able to connect us for a purpose, but it has to be ethical purpose, value-driven purpose. 
and uh, uh, this is just uh, uh, the uh, pilot that we did uh, in order to connect all of these ecosystem together. So we need to work with ecosystem platforms now and not actually uh, individual systems. And last but not least, uh, all what I have uh, speaking about uh, has been actually proven, proven by governments, proven by large organizations, and proven by non-profit organizations as well. And thank you very much, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elabed, for this very interesting and engaging talk. Uh, thanks uh, thank to all, uh, all of the speakers today. And uh, we have uh, around 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers from the public. So please. Uh, Oh, sorry, build-ins to different software um, that, that can also do that kind of checking and making sure it's compliant with the GDPR. And for certain, uh, for certain articles, I think that that's easier said than done. You know, for instance, I, 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 world, I live in the world of, transparent, or of, of data transfers a lot, and that is a very fast-moving section where there's lots of guidance and other, you know, uh, not just laws, but but you know uh, court cases and and other interpretations that are coming out, and so I'm wondering how your system um, handles that those those external sources as well instead of just directly reading from the GDPR and interpreting it with that kind of narrow um, uh, version because things have really changed in that area. Uh, actually. Um uh, you have uh, th three legs of the of the questions, so that you you are compliant. So you need the uh, rule first of all to understand the rule and its context, and this is actually the first part mm. uh, to cementize. You have uh, the person uh, on which uh, the rule applies. So you have the rule, the person on which the rule apply, and you have who should apply the rule, right? And in order to do that, you need data for each, and uh, this data is uh, within the person, first of all, uh, within the organization that is processing this data, and uh, within the uh, regulator that actually from the rule perspective. So uh, the system needs to have access, legal access, to the sources. So if it doesn't have legal access to the sources, you cannot verify. But if you uh, verify the GDPR, as we do it today, actually, uh, without having authorization uh, from the source, you are yourself breaching the GDPR. So the GDPR is breaching the GDPR. So our system here is uh, asking for authorization for the data at the source without intermediate, without transfer. And once you have the data at the source, you can actually harmonize in a semantic layer the meaning of all of things and generate the dynamic algorithms because the algorithms here are dynamic because you understand the context. Because if you don't understand the context and you have an algorithm, it is for every context, actually it doesn't reflect reality. Does this answer your question? So what, yeah? saying that the interpretation of the law changes ah. and, and pulling in that new ah. data, pulling in those new sources. Okay. A very good example here is, so yeah, after yeah, SHREMS yeah. 2 happened, you know, they, yeah. they abandoned yeah. the risk-based yeah. approach yeah. model yeah. and they, they have since said, well, transfers to the United States are, yeah. are yeah, basically yeah, yeah, verboten. Yeah. So how does your system okay. that this, new information? Yeah, so this is what uh, uh, Professor Servian Cardet explained. We work actually in linguistics and semantics. So actually, each time that we, you will connect to a database uh, or to a law, uh, you will uh, 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 detect its verbatim. And actually, this verbatim in the law, if you take the verbatim of the GDPR, you have 350 words, including the verbatim for person. 
And these words actually uh, are transformed into sem. Uh, the sem is the sense of the word. And actually when, you, uh, when the machine will read uh, the terms, it will understand within the context of the verbatim of the GDPR, the meaning. So, uh, so this is how we, 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 we detect. So we work with meanings and not with, with words. And you need the verbatim. And the knowledge base of the system will increase as, as much as you connect to new sources, to new codes, to new uh, data, et cetera. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions for all of the speakers? Yes, could you, yeah, use the mic. Yeah. Um, Professor Thierry Bregen, yes. uh, sorry, it, it's still a bit early. <laughs> um, with the, the results of your study, um, I was quite, interested in um, the number of responses saying, oh, we don't see any risks with GDPR versus, uh, I think, one or two slides later, um, uh, to what extent are we compliant? Um, is that uh, sort of over uh, confidence uh, on behalf of these companies or are they just not seeing the risks? Uh, with the qualitative um, market survey we are currently carrying out, uh, we can uh, confirm there is a lack of awareness of issues, of challenges. So for us, the main conclusion will be we have to, we, public organizations and uh, universities, we have to promote, to make a um, kind of awareness campaign about the, the issues. So um, there is a problem, especially in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, about this uh, GPR. And um, even in France, because uh, it takes time to, to make uh, so that we are compliant uh, with this uh, GDPR. So um, there is a lot of uh, work to to improve the, the situation, but it's a problem of awareness, yes. Yeah. I was already afraid that that was the case and not everybody being completely convinced <laughs> and sure that they had covered everything. Yes. Thank you. We have several more minutes for uh, some other questions. So, no other questions? Last chance? <laughs> okay, so we are on time, actually. I would like to thank again all the speakers, and uh, especially Professor Carde and Professor Isahara, who, uh, who participated online. Uh, and also uh, thank all, uh, all the attendees of this uh, panel. <laughs>